Uh, now, uh, it's my great honor to introduce the chair, uh, Dr. Margaret Liu, for the next session. Uh, many already know very, uh, Margaret very well. Margaret uh, herself is a pioneer of the uh, nuclear acid vaccine uh, for several decades. Uh, she is currently uh, the chair of uh, ISV board and also uh, a fellow of ISV. So it is my great honor uh, to introduce uh, Margaret uh, to serve as chair for next session. Margaret. Thank you very much, Sean, for that generous introduction. Uh, it, it's uh, a wonderful series and, and uh, Sean Liu has been so instrumental in organizing this. So thank you, Sean, on behalf of all of us who have benefited so much uh, in, the, in this ISV series. I'd like now to introduce Dr. Greg Glenn, who is the president of research and development and leads Novavax's uh, clinical and clinical and regulatory issues uh, and research. His responsibilities, in addition to what he's doing for the COVID vaccines, include other programs such as the RSV vaccine program and uh, including very importantly, maternal immunization. Uh, he also is responsible for the flu program and for other work uh, as well for Novavax. So uh, Dr. Glenn is going to give us an update about their important phase three studies and uh, we would welcome him now to go ahead and with his talk. Craig? Thanks, thanks Margaret. Thanks for that introduction. Nice to see you again. Uh, it's been, been a while and uh, it's a really a pleasure to be part of this meeting and uh, listen to some of my other uh, uh, colleagues. And so what I'm going to do today is just take you through our uh, COVID-19 program and give you an update. So if you go to the next slide, um, what, <clears throat> what I'd like to say at the beginning, well, safe harbor statement, if you go to the next slide, um, we, we have a vaccine that is, uh, you know, very elegantly named COVID-2373. It is a recombinant nanoparticle it contains matrix M adjuvant. It's premixed in a, in a vial. It's sta sta uh, stable at standard refrigeration temperatures. And I think the hallmark of our vaccine is its immunogenicity, efficacy, and safety. Uh, so I'm going to walk through uh, our clinical program, sort of, um, and uh, talk through our, our, you know, our future plans. Let's go to the next slide. So just to say, you know, we followed a very good. Um, publication track record. I think, uh, you know, we believe in peer review science and I'm happy to say that our preclinical work is published in Nature Science. Our, our clinical work has been tracked in the New England Journal. Uh, we're, we're committed to transparency and publication of the results. Go to the next slide. So, a recombinant protein uh, is one of the one of the uh, technologies that was highlighted, uh, you know, by the U.S. government as they look for solutions. And being a U.S. company, we were able to uh, enjoy the uh, you know the uh, help of the U.S. government in developing our programs. And one reason I think that they looked at this, uh, in addition to some of the genetic immunization approaches like mRNA and vectors is that the recombinant protein vaccine is a well-established technology. And in fact, uh, I you know, just show up here some very well-known uh, insect cell uh, production-based uh, recombinant protein adjuvant vaccines as analogs. So as a, as a uh, you know, as a, as a program and technology that would maybe decrease the risk of development in this field, uh, they invested in the recombinant protein adjuvant technology from Novavax. If you go to the next slide. So just quickly, busy, nice graphic, I think, but busy. Uh, but just to show you how we make the vaccine, you can see one up in the upper left. We take the DNA, uh, you know, obviously the gene of interest here is a spike protein. It's put into the baclovirus. Uh, the baclovirus expresses this uh, protein. Uh, and you can see it's actually expressed in lipid rafts, purified uh, in the uh, uh, process of manufacturing, in which uh, we, during which we make nanoparticles. You can see under five there, we form these PS80 protein structure micelles. These are full length uh, proteins. They're natively folded prefusion forms. Uh, they are uh, reflecting many of the qualities you'd find in a uh, natural uh, 
virus. They are stabilized. The, as you probably know, the wild type spike protein is quite unstable. And this, uh, this, this the stabilized mutations, as well as the, the uh, uh, nanoparticle formulation, make this into a very stable uh, protein, and hence the ability to use it in the uh, standard refrigerated temperatures. We also mix matrix in. You can see a little photomicrograph at the top. They're separate particles. Uh, they're little, almost like buckyballs. They're both around the 40 nanometers, which reflect the size of a virus. And together they make for a highly immunogenic uh, vaccine that is presenting the spike protein in its native configuration. If you go to the next slide, please. So uh, you can see here, these are uh, micrographs of the uh, uh, matrix M and uh, uh, the nanoparticle at the bottom. And the nanoparticle does form different arrays of, of something in the order of, of you know, one to 14 spike proteins in the nanoparticle. And as I mentioned, the matrix M is, is a, a separate entity in the same formulation. If you go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk first about our, our phase one, two trial. If you go to the next slide, this was conducted in the US and uh, Australia. Uh, and this just slide here was, um, you know, at, at that time we were looking for a benchmark and we were able to obtain convalescent sera from uh, quite ill uh, subjects. And you can see here looking at the anti-spike IgG and the placebo, uh, the 25 microgram dosing group without adjuvant, uh, the one dose in the middle uh, with matrix M and then the two dose regimens, you can see that the adjuvant was critical. Uh, the dose uh, was actually, um, the, the dose response is actually at its peak at five micrograms, indicating this is dose sparing. And overall, as we've reported, the safety was quite good. So if you go to the next slide, we here show here, uh, the, uh, we illustrate the uh, kinetics, and I was interested to hear some of the discussion earlier. So we have data out to six months, and you can see here, we put in yellow the band of the convalescent sera. So obviously the, uh, the orange is placebo, the light blue is the single dose with matrix M, and the two dose regimen with uh, matrix M. And again, you can see that we, we saw a very nice dose sparing effect uh, of the adjuvant. Uh, where we could not see a difference between 5 and 25 micrograms, really quite high responses exceeding what we were measuring in convalescent sera, and persistence out to uh, essentially six months of an antibody response that looked within the range of convalescent sera, which at the time we hypothesized would, would predict protection. So the adjuvant's important, uh, there's dose sparing, uh, and the immune response is quite robust. So if you go to the next slide, we have taken uh, subjects in our phase uh, two trial, uh, and this allows us an opportunity to see how boosting uh, would, how booster sh uh, shot would behave. So we have participants from the five microgram dose, and they either received a booster, um, and uh, they're either uh, either five micrograms on day zero, or five micrograms on day zero and 21. And we'll see those results, uh, you know, coming shortly. Uh, very important to see how the vaccine will, in fact, boost previously immunized subjects at six months. We'll also do this at 12 months. Uh, again, uh, we, we can talk about this later, but we believe that boosting is going to be an important strategy for these uh, technologies in the, in the near future. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we're, I'm now going to go to the phase two trial that was done in South Africa. If you go to the next slide, uh, this was a um, opportunity that that came early in the program. Uh, South Africa experienced an incredibly intense wave uh, in uh, the uh, months of, of May, June uh, timeframe, at which time we were planning our trials. We uh, were we launched our immunizations uh, in um, in the uh, end of uh, August, and uh, you can see the surveillance period for uh, subjects that have received two doses occurred in November. Well, this was a very dramatic uh, turn of events in the terms that the uh, variants of interest uh, arose, the B1351 in particular. So, uh, you know, not having control on this, we were conducting our trial in quite a fluid situation, both with a second, a very intense second wave caused by a new variant of concern. And in particular, one of the observations we, we did see there is that P1351 
people who are seropositive, that is, had um, obviously had infections uh, during the first wave, uh, had a very still had a very high rate of acquisition of infection from the variant. Uh, again, kind of raising their concerns that the, the natural immunity induced by the, the the ancestral strain was not protective against the, the the variant of interest. If you go to the next slide, so overall it was a very good safety profile. You can see here placebo in gray and uh, vaccine in blue in terms of, of uh, safety events, uh, serious adverse events and so on. If you go to the next slide, uh, we did see uh, you know, really, I think quite good efficacy, and uh, especially in the severe, we had uh, five uh, hospitalizations, two deaths in the in the um, placebo, and none in the vaccinees. We had a, embedded in this population was a HIV uh, uh, subset, which was you know going to be very important, I think, to look at the immune compromised population. And overall, against the uh, variant, uh, we saw about a 50% level of protection against mild, moderate, or severe disease. So quite a range, very good protection, complete protection against uh, severe disease, but against mild, moderate, severe, uh, we have about 50% protection. If you go to the next slide, at the same time, we were conducting a trial in the UK. If you go to the next slide, this is a phase three pivotal trial. Uh, again, you can see the um, the uh, time uh, over time how the variants of interest did evolve, and we again timed this without really planning to uh, do the trial during a time when there was quite a dramatic evolution of the virus to the B117 strain, and. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see we had quite a uh, you know interesting result, very good result. So overall, the vaccine efficacy was 90 percent. Uh, you can see the breakdown by case severity. There are five severes in the placebo and none in the vaccine. Again, again, rep um, I think uh, reflecting what we saw in South Africa, where the protection against severe disease is, is complete. And uh, we saw some very interesting features here. Here we were able to uh, pro we were able to fingerprint the strains that the uh, subject acquired. And when we looked at the prototype variant, we saw a vaccine efficacy of 96.4%. Uh, and then against the B117 variant, it was 86.3%. Some other interesting findings include the, um, the, the 14 days after the first dose, we saw 83% efficacy. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the severe cases were all the placebo group and four of those five were attributed to B117. We also had a very good uh, result in adults over 65 years of age where we saw uh, approximately 89% vaccine efficacy. If you go to the next slide, you can see the Kaplan-Meier um, curve on the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, safety. So uh, this is a this I think is you know uh, the hallmark of our vaccine. Very good safety profile. The way this um, this uh, figure is structured, you can see dose one and dose two in the left, and these are local symptoms: tenderness, pain, erythema, and swelling. And you can see the the uh, columns are mild, moderate, and severe. And the gap that you see the bar there represents the gap between the placebo and the vaccine. And you can see pretty much everything that's uh, clustered in the in the mild or, or moderate. And these are all very uh, low rates and uh, very little severe uh, findings that are distinguished from placebo in the local. There's a little more um, uh, tenderness and pain in the second dose. Again, mostly mild and uh, the majority is mild or none. If you go to the next slide, Similar picture for systemic uh, symptoms. Again, dose one, dose two, representing here headache, muscle pain, fatigue, uh, et cetera. Um, and you can see again, very uh, uh, little uh, delta between the placebo and the vaccinees, and really the activity is restricted to mild or moderate. And again, most of the findings, most of the subjects experienced no or mild symptoms. So very good safety profile. Uh, of our vaccine, which has seen to be replicated in, in all of our trials. If you go to the next slide, so this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, over time, you can see uh, the case acquisition in the uh, gray bar are the placebos, and you can see the dark dots are the acquisition of severe events, uh, all found in the placebo, and uh, very few events, of course, happening in the vac vaccinees. Really a very good result uh, showing the vaccine efficacy is high. If you go to the next slide, so overall, 
Uh, just to summarize, we saw 96% efficacy against the original COVID-19 strain, 86% against B117 variant, which is first described in the UK, 89% uh, in uh, efficacy in uh, participants over 65 years of age. And I should mention that we had 45% of the subjects in the trial had uh, significant uh, medical comorbidities, and we saw 91% efficacy in those participants as well. So really a very uh, favorable result in this pivotal phase three trial. If you go to the next slide, now I'm gonna just talk about our US trial. Uh, it, this is being conducted in US and Mexico. And if you go to the next slide, um, we, uh, you know, this trial had many challenges. The trial got underway in late December, during which there were EUAs. And so we, uh, you know, there was some uh, concern that we might not actually be able to complete. We may be the last of the efficacy studies that can be done in the US, the randomized placebo controlled trials. So this trial had 30,000 participants. It's randomized two to one. Uh, again, standardized endpoints um, uh, you know, uh, compared to the uh, South Africa and UK trial, very similar endpoints, and it was an active uh, surveillance trial. So this trial is, is really complete. We're about to unblind. We began to cross over in the study. Uh, we allowed the, the way this works, subjects who, um, you know, in our trial were very interested in having the Novavax vaccine. And so we were able to uh, really towards the end of April, offer everyone who wanted to, to receive the vaccine, uh, the blind to crossover protocol, where either if you had, of course, they don't know if they had placebo, they were given the active and if they got the active, they were placebo. And they, we have in, in by and large the subjects uh, you know, could not um, really project what vaccine they got because the safety profile was so so very benign. We've also um, conduct we're also conducting a pediatric extension study uh, underway. If you go to the next slide, I'll describe that a little bit. Um, oh, just to, to say again, you know, we had a similar situation now in the U.S. Uh, very intense transmission during the uh, the winter evolution to the B117, which I think has reached about 60% of all the strains. So again, we're going to have a very nice sampling of, of things that look more like the ancestral virus uh, and uh, uh, strains of it, variants of interest with the, the B117 uh, 501Y mutation. So um, if you go to the next slide, a few uh, comments about the crossover. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, either subjects uh, who would receive the active are going to get the placebo. Uh, and again, uh, the people who have received the placebo will get two injections of the, of the active vaccine in a blinded fashion. So this, uh, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, pretty much complete. And uh, as I said, this trial is, is very close to unblinding. If you go to the next uh, slide, we are, uh, in this uh, prevent 19 phase three pediatric expansion, extending our experience to the pediatric population. We have plans to go down to lower age groups. Uh, the uh, regulators asked us to start with adolescents. So we have, we're enrolling uh, adolescents uh, 12 to 17 years of age. They'll receive uh, two injections or a of the vaccine or placebo. And uh, we expect to uh, begin uh, uh, the blinded crossover again to, to offer everyone vaccination six months after their initial set of, of immunizations. If you go to the next slide. So I think key takeaways from our clinical experience to date, we are seeing very strong efficacy uh, against the original strain, 96%, 86% for the B117. Remembering that these are all, uh, these are all really all comers, if you will, mild, moderate, or severe. 51% against the 1351 variant. And in the, in the trials uh, to date, we've seen uh, no severe cases in the vaccinees and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, severe cases in the placebo. We also, as I hope, hopefully I've described, have a very favorable uh, safety profile. If you go to the next slide. So just talk a little bit about the variant strain. If you go to the next slide, we are, of course, you know, interested. We're recombinant technology. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, we uh, are developing variant vaccines. In fact, we have um, new constructs representing really pretty much every one of the variants that are out there. Uh, we're thinking about both the variant and bi the 
bivalent approaches where we'd have a combination of the 1351 either by itself or um, as uh, as a um, as a combination vaccine. So we have some data and I'm going to show you in a minute uh, that the variant date uh, strain can boost really very nicely uh, the, when uh, subjects are primed uh, based on the uh, on the uh, original strain and we expect to initiate uh, clinical evaluation in one more of these candidates shortly. So if you go to the next slide, this is a study where uh, we had baboons who uh, have been really a, quite a good model for predicting human immunity. We had baboons that have been immunized this time last year with the uh, Wuhan 2373 vaccine that we have. You can see on the far left that vaccination uh, in, in blue are animals that receive various doses with matrix M and then in the orange were, were animals that receive the antigen alone. And then you can see in the far right at about 310 days, uh, we were able to boost them with our variant uh, spike protein, which is the B1351 uh, recombinant spike protein with matrix M. And you can see within seven days, we had very robust responses. In fact, this, these are spike responses. Uh, they were greater than uh, what we saw originally, either interrogated with the uh, 1351 spike or the, uh, the, the uh, ancestral spike. Very robust responses, very little uh, response to a second dose, um, you know, after after priming. So this suggests to us that a single dose of the 1351 in seropositive subjects, either from vaccination or uh, from uh, infection, uh, should provide extremely high uh, immunity to the uh, to the variant. If you go to the next slide, we did interrogate uh, this response. This is uh, quite interesting. This is an assay. It's a, a receptor binding blocking antibody assay, which requires uh, antibodies that can interfere with a very high affinity event of binding of spike to ACE2. And on the left, you can see we use the ancestral spike as the uh, reagent in this assay. And on the right, the uh, the uh, 1351 spike. And you can see really no difference um, in this in this assay between the uh, the the, uh, the the two different uh, using the two different spikes, again suggesting that use of the 1351 spike as an immunogen should also protect against the ancestral uh, strains. And uh, I heard um, Honey talking a little bit about this as a as a convergent evolution product, and I think that the 1351 looks to us like a you know the appropriate candidate to push forward. Um, so very interesting, you know, single dose uh, possibilities with this uh, with this uh, boost uh, using the 1351 recombinant spike. If you go to the next slide. So we have some other uh, activities that are ongoing. The UK government is conducting a um, study run by the University of Oxford where they're assess assess uh, assessing two priming regimens with Pfizer, AZ, Moderna's vaccines and Novavax. Uh, again, various combinations given at eight weeks apart, sort of a mix and match study. Uh, they are doing the, um, you know, the immunologic uh, assays using micronutes and IgG, of course, looking at the safety and uh, that dose, uh, that, that study is well underway. The UK government also uh, sponsored a trial run by the University Hospital at Southampton, assessing a third dose of vaccine to participants of our vaccine who received two doses of Oxford AZ or Pfizer vaccine three months earlier. There are seven manufacturers that are in involved in this study. And again, these are uh, looking at mixing and matching and boosting. And again, they're measuring the immunogenicity and safety and uh, the uh, dosing in that study is about to begin shortly. If you go to the next slide, please. So just very quickly, if you go to the next slide, we are we are very busy. Uh, you know, our first product is the regulatory submissions, and you can see we have engagement with multiple regulators. Uh, we're gratified to have very constructive interactions with that. Um, so these are the rolling reviews that are happening in various markets, and we anticipate filing for authorization in the UK, US, and Europe in the third quarter. Okay, if you go to the next slide. All right, so uh, thank you very much and uh, I'm you know, available for, for discussion. I hope that was uh, informative. We're very upbeat about our vaccine. The safety profile looks extremely good 
and we have uh, now um, you know two randomized placebo controlled trials showing the vaccine works quite well data on the variants and uh, we're shortly to see uh, data in the US uh, just maybe one last thing to mention the demographics in these trials sort of represent a really nice quilt if you will of of different uh, demographics so obviously in South Africa it was mostly uh, black African in the UK it was more white aged uh, comorbid in the uh, US we had, were very successful recruiting uh, African American Latino uh, Native American Asian and uh, uh, so we have a very nice mix in our demographics in terms of exposure of the vaccine. Uh, I think that'll help overall the safety package and immunogenicity package and efficacy package of, of our regulatory filings. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. This was a, a wonderful talk and you provided actually answers to a number of the questions that have been asked. Uh, we particularly appreciated the way that you were able to show over the time course the different variants that arose during the trials because uh, this has been uh, an important aspect of the pandemic. Um, I think that one of the biggest questions uh, that that the audience has been asking has to do with the timing of the filing. So you you mentioned what you're planning. Um, could you speak a little bit more though why there have been these delays and um, what specifically are the challenges? Uh, simply you're ramping up at so many manufacturing sites and when will you be releasing the data? I think that you made the point this is a uh, very well understood type of vaccine in terms of being a recombinant protein. So uh, if you could explain then why then there are these delays that that have come about. Yeah, I mean, I, I always squirm a little bit because um, these are programs that generally take many years to reach licensure. And so we we as a as a small company last about this time last year, you know, we were we were really just uh, above 100 people. And we, so we've had to build a company and a vaccine in the past year. So that includes not having under our direct, uh, you know, control a manufacturing facility. So we have gone to, uh, you know, two in the US, one in the UK, one in Spain. We, uh, through CEPI, purchased a large facility in the Czech Republic. We are working with Serum Institute of India, which heretofore was the largest maker of vaccines in and and, uh, and um, SK Bio in Korea and Takeda in Japan. So a huge manufacturing network is now established. They're making uh, material at all those sites. It's just a very you know when I hear delay, I mean I you know wish we were faster, uh, but I, I I think our team has done an admirable job of composing the CMC and re and and uh, clinical packages that that we have. Um, and you know we've had to build a company so in addition to you know developing the vaccine there's been a huge amount of just creating a, a you know a, a uh, um, infrastructure internally so um, yes I wish it was earlier uh, I think you know when we look at the global need uh, for vaccine we think we're going to play an important role and we're just we're extremely uh, committed to you know all out to provide regulators you know answers and data to to their questions so so I just when I look at the development I don't there's no particular you know glitch if you will it's really doing what I would say is standard for for a you know for a new vaccine uh, we we try to you know create the highest standards in terms of, of quality and uh, you know I think we'll will succeed in uh, in getting uh, licensure in the next, you know, as we said, in the, certainly by quarter three. Well, oh, thank you very much. I mean, I think that uh, you should take these comments more as how there is such a uh, lot of enthusiasm for hoping that the vaccine is authorized for you soon. I think that that your data is uh, is has been impressive and also that people are comfortable um, with knowing the technology, but also seeing how with your specific adjuvant, you've been able to do the 
uh, increase the potency and do the dose sparing. So I think that perhaps you should uh, see it as more a uh, an impatience with looking forward to things. But um, but thank you for explaining all of the the challenges because uh, certainly for all the vaccines, thinking of the worldwide global scale has been uh, a Herculean task for for all the companies. Um, so we assume then that we're hoping that these timetables then for releasing the data and unblinding and all of the information will be uh, coming along uh, it, it uh, hopefully against this new timetable that you've expressed for the third quarter yep. Um, yep. yeah may I say you know we've also from the from the beginning uh, had a global view a hope that our vaccine could be deployed I think we've again we have done something that's never been done we've created a, a network of manufacturing in such a short period of time and a plan you know through COVAX uh, through our partners with CEPI uh, through our partners at, at Serum and SK, et cetera, to distribute the vaccine both to the high income as well as the low income countries. So I think, you know, we're extremely uh, gratified when we, you know, we get up in the morning. That's what we, we, you know, we live for is to give, get, get the vaccine to the, 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 you know, the people who need it the most. Uh, not to say the U.S. doesn't need it, uh, but we're very focused now on, on making sure that uh, we can help uh, you know, fill the global need. And I appreciate your compliment. We have the same impatience um, and, uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be this time next year. I hope we can look back on a really nice success story there for distribution of our vaccine to the to the rest of the world. OK, well, I certainly hope so. There there have been so many questions that basically are asking when. Uh, so people are very eager. And uh, I think that if you know, thank you for explaining this because we certainly hope that that the the data can also be released quickly, particularly because you have been doing trials in different geographies, and so you have information yes. up against the different variants. So that leads us then to um, uh, other questions related to this, which is, uh, you know, now that there are vaccines available for increasingly younger age groups as the trials are moving along, could you speak to any ideas about your timing, uh, both for younger age groups, but then also as a next question that, that since all these trials are going along at the same time, in terms of what the strategy is for your different either boosters or for incorporating um, the different variant strains into your into the vaccine. OK, so let's go backwards. So we have a, we have a nice variant construct. It's under manufacture. Uh, we haven't really announced a timetable, but but I think shortly we'll be in the clinic. And I think our our goal is to be prepared uh, for the decisions that that um, I think you know the public health community will make. So the issues there is you know most people, many people will be seropositive. I think the data I showed you today is if you took the variant strain and, and immunized people who had been exposed to the ancestral strain or vaccine, uh, you'll see a very robust boost. So, so it's kind of our view, our strategy that in seropositive subjects, probably the 1351 variant vaccine will will be sufficient. And we we I, um, I forget if we've posted or or not, but we have very nice data in the preclinical setting where if we immunize, we get very good sort of with 1351, we get very good back protection. Uh, against the uh, challenge against the, the the ancestral strain, so so as well as of course from the uh, the match strain. So we think that in zero people have had experience either with infection or vaccine that a booster dose uh, with our vaccine you know will will really uh, you know be uh, sufficient. However, you know there's going to be a large population that still are have not. And so in our trials, we were you know even in South Africa we were finding. The zero prevalence was five percent. So herd immunity is is you know a little bit undefined, unknown in our trials. Obviously, in, uh, you know not so recent, but in in December, January, we're not finding that the zero prevalence is that high. So there still, I think, would be a need to be able to address people who are zero negative, and there we see a do, two dose regimen, and we're anticipating that that would be wise to include the bivalent. You know, Wuhan-based uh, strain as well as the 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 one three five one. So that's how we're thinking about the the variants. As you could see, we have a very uh, I think thorough look look going on in the UK 
on various strategies to mix and match, including boosting on top of other vaccines. So that data is going to be generated in the next you know, few months or so. So we'll be poised uh, if, uh, you know, if and when we are approved to be part of the strategy to, to boost, which I think is going to be needed. I, I, I believe we're going to see the antibodies wane and I think the risk of, of letting uh, the, the, you know, the uh, bad actor back in the door will, will, will be so such that we will want to boost people and, and maybe on an annual basis. So we'll be prepared to have the data to allow uh, that to happen. So I think those are, and you had the first question, I was going backwards, uh, forgot what the first question was. Uh, so, so I think that, that I mean, there've been so many questions about timing, but also yeah. then about moving into younger age groups as well. Oh yes, well. thank you. Yes, as I presented where we are in the, uh, we're doing an adolescent trial in the US, 12 to 17 year old, that is, that is going to be a, uh, you know, immunogenicity and efficacy study. So obviously it's not powered, uh, but but uh, that's nearing, you know, the recruitment. Uh, so so that'll be our data to support the adolescent immunization. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, agreed with the FDA at least to uh, go down to school age children uh, once we've reached, uh, uh, you know, a milestone with that adolescent trial. So we, we agree with the strategy to immunize you know, school age adolescents, and obviously, uh, 18 and above. So we're generating data in all those populations. So um, one question about, uh, you know, there have been during this pandemic when one thinks about needing to immunize the entire population of the globe, there have been concerns about even shortages of the glass for syringes, et cetera. Um, uh, what about your, your adjuvant, your matrix M? Do you have any concerns about, uh, you know, supply of of that or of any of your other reagents, your bioreactor bags or, uh, you know, any other components? Yeah, we have experienced uh, at different countries, you know, problems with, you know, bags, filters, you know, so raw materials for manufacturing and, you know, at various levels that's being solved, but it's, it, it is, you know, definitely has, has been something that has hampered some of our sites. Uh, you know, last year when we, we were using Matrix M for our nano flu vaccine, we were anticipating, you know, with a lot of success, we might need 50 million doses of Matrix M. So now we're talking about, you know, billion dose capacity. And we were quite concerned about this time last year, a major effort to look at the complete supply chain from the tree to the to the raw materials to the formulation. And we really dialed that up. It's a fairly simple manufacturing process. Uh, the supplier, uh, you know, has in the past, uh, the supply has also, you know, this is a, a, a food additive that saponin is a fairly, it's a, you know, complex soap. So in fact, uh, we have, I think, a very good handle now on supply and, you know, can deliver, um, you know, billions of doses of, of our adjuvant. And so that is a, obviously a key feature of our, our product. So. And I think you know the fact that we're using such small doses, and we we are we do intend to look at at a little more dose sparing because every you know every few micrograms can increase your capacity by forty percent. But five micrograms is a really you know very modest of the antigen is a very modest dose. So so I think the summary is the supply chain for Matrix M is very sound, uh, and the the um, you know, I think we are we are like many struggling in certain areas with with uh, manufacturing supplies, but that's increasingly uh, becoming resolved, as you can imagine, because it's such an important uh, endeavor. So um, I'm just going to have one last question, but before I ask it, I just want uh, you to know that there have been uh, so many questions coming in asking about uh, the assurance of the timing of uh, when you will present the data rather than pushing back uh, the data and suggestions that you might uh, seek to capitalize more on some existing manufacturer's capabilities since the recombinant technology, as you point out, is one that, that all vaccine manufacturers are capable with. But we'll, we'll move on from that because I, I think that these are things that are still fluid and in motion. But uh, just so you know, there's been a lot of in interest, as I'm sure you're aware about, uh, more specificity for timing of release of the data as well as for the filings. So my last very, question um, has to very, deal very with- Very shortly, yes. Shortly. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll we'll look forward to that information and to the filings. Um, so my last question is has to deal with T cell responses because one of the uh, points people have hoped for is that T cell responses might actually be a way to help target some of the variants. And um, the, the issue is that as recombinant protein vaccine, even though you're using matrix M, uh, that, that the, you know, thinking is that traditionally you don't necessarily get um, the same types of MHC class one restricted CD8 responses besides the CD4 responses that you might get from other uh, mechanisms such as gene-based vaccines. And so I wonder if you could address that. Uh, and while you're doing it, just put in a word if you have any data about uh, your immune response's efficacy against the variant that's come out of India. Yeah, so no, we haven't really, uh, we, we not, we're not collecting data yet in India on efficacy, so I don't have anything to say, but, but you know, obviously we're all high concerned about that very grave uh, situation there. We're glad to be collaborating with the largest manufacturer in the world who is extremely concerned about their own people. So, so you can, we, we are working closely with them to try to develop solutions. You know, with respect to, to, uh, to uh, T cells, you know, we, we know our technology from flu makes very good CD4 effector memory cells. And, uh, and one of the hallmarks of our, our flu program was to show in older adults, where as you probably know, there's, this, there's immune senescence and often almost a complete absence of response to, to stimulation with, with uh, you know, in the CD4 effector memory setting. We really rescue those people and, de and develop antigen-specific CD4 effector memory cells. So that you know that generally undergirds uh, you know antity, uh, antigen uh, you know uh, sorry antibody uh, affinity maturation and memory, and so those are really important. I think what you know, and we we know in animals that the recombinant uh, nanoparticle in matrix M can make very nice CD8s. We have struggled. Uh, to uh, show that in humans. We did uh, actually punt, and uh, I think um, the people at Scripps, Shane Crotty, uh, we punted some some of our, you know, cells to them, and I think, you know, there'll be some data forthcoming. But I, I guess what I, when I look at what, what we're seeing with efficacy of 96%, which I think is kind of miraculous for a viral vaccine, it tells me that the you know, the quality of the antibodies are very important and the broadly neutralized antibodies, again, are very important. So the nanoparticle in flu, you know, the, the one of the great merits it has is it, it is no longer in the uh, configuration is in nature where it's tightly packed on the virus surface. So in nature, you know, it's the head that's exposed to immune pressure, uh, but our nanoparticle has is presenting the stem, uh, you know, the vestigial esterase, kind of the side, et cetera. And we see we've we've developed data with with uh, with the uh, um, spike protein as well. So there are conserved epitopes. There was a SARS-1 um, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody. We know that that binds to our vaccine. We know we make competing antibodies for it. So I think one of our expectations is matrix M and the nanoparticle drive broadly neutralizing antibodies that are outside of, of the, the domains that are under immune pressure that undergo this convergent evolution. And I think you're seeing that, um, you know, we do have cross protection where in, in, at least in South Africa, we were seeing that the natural infection was conferring very little immunity uh, against the, the variant. So I think we are qualitatively different. Uh, right now, you know, focus on immune correlates, I think will be, based on the, uh, you know, on antibody responses. And it, it seems to me that you're seeing blocking an infection that has to be neutralizing antibody. And we have, you know, some work going on with the, the Reagan Institute, Galit Alters group, looking at other antibody mediated functions that are maybe not neutralizing, but but as a, as a whole, right now, I think our, our main focus is that we're making these very robust antibody responses and they seem to be highly protective. Thank you very much. This was actually a great lead into our next speaker. So I thank you for your talk and for the answers to the questions. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Liu then. Thank Thanks, you. Margaret. Thank you. 
Thank you, Margaret and Greg. That was a wonderful uh, discussion. I have to do a little bit commercial. Every time we have talk uh, from Norvex, we have a lot of participants, so over 500. That's wonderful.